Chadwick William D. Carr was born on August 5, 1988, and went by Chad. In early 2021, 32-year-old Chad was living in Clinton, Tennessee, and was described as a friendly, funny, and very outgoing individual who loved to make people laugh. Unfortunately, he also got himself involved with drugs, but was trying to get clean after an overdose. By May of 2021, he was in the 90-day program at The Foundation, a recovery halfway house for addicts. While staying there, he found employment with a construction company, and on May 1st, he bought himself a vehicle. The following night, at around 8 p.m., Chad walked outside to the front of the recovery center to call his sister Whitney, who he spoke to on a nearly daily basis along with his mother. During the call, he sat the phone down to light a cigarette, and Whitney could hear him talking to someone. The call then suddenly ended. She tried several times to call him back, but there was no answer. That would sadly be the last time she ever spoke to her brother. He then missed the early morning meeting at the facility and failed to show up for his construction job. At 3 p.m., a friend of his at the facility called his family and informed them that Chad had missed the morning meeting. At that point, his family was very concerned and filed a missing person report with the Anderson County Sheriff's Office. Strangely, his wallet, keys to his new van, and cell phone were found inside the facility, and a single flip-flop was found outside along with his van. However, Chad was nowhere to be found. Unfortunately, the facility lacked surveillance cameras. The sheriff's office spent two weeks searching for him before releasing a statement that they had exhausted all efforts. Some speculate that maybe a drug dealer showed up to collect on a debt, but that is pure speculation. Sadly, as of June 2024, Chad has not been found, and this case remains unsolved. Heather Louise Schwab was born in Dallas, Texas on November 15, 1987, to parents Stephen and Tamara Joe. In 2022, 35-year-old Heather was a mother of two living in McKinney, Texas. Unfortunately, she was in a very tumultuous relationship with 42-year-old Chad Christopher Stevens, who was allegedly very abusive towards her. The home they lived in regularly had the windows boarded up and trash strewn across the backyard. When Heather would talk with her mother, Tamara, who she wasn't particularly close to, she would say that she feared Chad would kill her one day. Chad wasn't exactly an upstanding citizen and had a total of 24 arrests in Collin County, Texas alone. Those arrests consist of charges for assault, theft, and drugs. Sadly, that same year, Heather fell out of contact with her family. Jeremy Buddy and Victor Mendoza, who were Heather's neighbors, occasionally provided Tamara with updates about her daughter. Then sometime in 2022, all communication with her stopped. In June 2023, Jeremy and Victor told Tamara that they hadn't seen Heather for several months, and when they asked Chad about it, he said she had died of cancer. This immediately concerned Tamara, who hadn't spoken to her daughter in almost a year. She feared that he might have finally gone through with his threats to kill her, and subsequently reported her missing on June 28, 2023. When investigators questioned Chad, he said that Heather had left him about a year ago, and he hadn't seen her since. A few months later, on November 3, 2023, Chad's ex-wife spoke with Tamara and said that her daughter, Brianna, who is also the daughter of Chad, spoke with him on November 2nd and said that he sarcastically said that he killed Heather and buried her in his backyard. Brianna also said that when she informed him of her pregnancy, he threatened to kill her and her unborn child. Tamara immediately took this information to the police. Investigators then obtained a search warrant to search the backyard. Using a drone, they took multiple photos and noticed several anomalies. Then, another one of Chad's exes came forward and told police that he had assaulted her in January of 2023. He was then arrested, and a search warrant was obtained for the inside of the home. On November 6, 2023, when officers entered the home, they strangely found that the kitchen had been walled off with sheetrock. Upon removing the sheetrock, officers found a refrigerator wrapped in plastic. Inside, they shockingly found Heather's remains. Chad then changed his tune and said that Heather died on July 26, 2022, after falling and hitting her head in the shower. 
Investigators were quickly able to prove this information was false because police had been called out to Chad's home on August 12, 2022, after a neighbor saw him screaming while Heather was waving a gun in the air. This proves she was still alive in August and most likely died shortly after. Heather's cause and manner of death have not been released to the public, but Chad has since been charged with tampering with evidence. While it's been said that more charges are likely, as of June 2024, he has yet to be charged in connection with her death, and this case remains unsolved. Judith Ann Emke was born on June 29, 1946, and went by Judy. In 1986, 40-year-old Judy was living northwest of Nashville in Ashland City, Tennessee, with her husband Daryl, a veteran of the U.S. Air Force who served in Vietnam and went by the nickname Tex, and their three children. She was described as an exceptionally diligent worker and a very loving mother. On the morning of November 26, 1986, the day before Thanksgiving, Tex left his home while his two daughters were at the bus stop waiting for the school bus. He arrived at around 7 a.m. to pick Judy up from her night shift at the Cheatham County Nursing Home, where she worked as a nurse's aide. After that, Judy was never seen again. When all three children returned home, they found it strange that the door to the house was locked, especially since Judy was always home at that time. Not long after, Tex arrived home with groceries that were for Thanksgiving the following day. When he opened the door and went to the bedroom, he shockingly found that all her clothes were missing, including the scrubs that she was wearing that morning. Plus, the photos from the albums were missing, as well as some of her jewelry. Tex then told the kids that their mother had left with another man and gave them a goodbye letter that she allegedly typed up. It also had her signature on it. However, people who knew Judy found that strange and said that she always hand wrote all her notes. After one of the kids read it, he threw it away. After that day, she was never seen again. Come to find out, Judy and Tex were having marital problems, and two days before she disappeared, she met with an attorney about getting a divorce and custody of the children. Friends and family found her disappearance strange and didn't believe she would ever leave without her children. Tex quickly became the prime suspect in the case. Suspicion surrounding him was made worse by the fact that he waited two weeks to report her missing and only after one of the children told a school counselor about it. Their home was searched multiple times, but no evidence relating to her disappearance was found. The house has since burned down. One of Judy's co-workers told investigators that early that month, she had an affair with one of her neighbors. She even thought she might be pregnant. The man she allegedly had an affair with was looked at as a potential suspect, but once again, there was no evidence to tie him to her disappearance. Tex went on to be arrested several times for assault and theft, and even a sexual assault conviction in 1993 that netted him 25 years in prison. The incident occurred when Judy began keeping the boy when he was eight years old. However, his conviction was later overturned due to the lack of dates and times provided by the victim. Up until his death in 2017, he maintained his innocence and never changed his story regarding the events of that day. Since her disappearance, a DNA profile has been created, but it still hasn't led to her whereabouts, and as of June 2024, this case remains unsolved. Mary Elizabeth Pewitt was born Mary Elizabeth Sport on February 22, 1963, to Elizabeth and Albert Russell Sport in Lubbock, Texas. Elizabeth married David Morgan on May 26, 1972, and he adopted Mary and changed her last name to Morgan. She was described as a fun individual who enjoyed cooking with her daughters. In early 1988, 25-year-old Mary was living in Comanche, Oklahoma with her two daughters, Kira and Amber Allen, and working as a bartender at Harold's Club. By that time, she had been divorced twice and was separated from her current husband, Stan, who was in jail after being accused of stealing about $3,500 from Mary's parents' property. On June 3, 1988, Mary dropped her daughters off at her parents' home and headed off to work. When her shift ended around midnight, she drove to the bar owner's home to drop off that night's receipts. She arrived back home around 12.45 a.m., where she met her boyfriend, Randy Benson. 
After they watched TV for a little while, he left. At 6.30 a.m., her mother, Elizabeth, arrived at her home to drop the girls off. However, when she knocked on the door, there was no answer. Her daughter, Amber, climbed up on a built-in brick planter and peered through the window. That's when she saw the worst thing a child could possibly imagine, her mother all covered in blood. Elizabeth rushed inside to find her daughter had been stabbed to death. An autopsy determined there were over 30 wounds on her body, but she had not been sexually assaulted. Investigators determined that the murder weapon belonged to Mary, and since there was no forced entry, they believed her killer was someone she knew. Mary's father, David, said that he saw her first husband, Ricky Tidwell, pull up outside her house one night, not long before she was murdered. However, when he was brought in for questioning, he said that he was out of town on the night in question, which was confirmed by his mother. Mary's second husband, Tim Allen, was also looked at. Allegedly, he and his new wife beat up Mary in her backyard a few months before her death. Mary later retaliated by stabbing him in the hand with a knife. Allen confirmed this, but said he couldn't remember what it was all about and said that he had never hit her back. Her current husband, Stan, was ruled out because he was in jail the night of Mary's murder. However, Mary's father, David, said that Stan had physically abused her in the past. Randy Benson was also looked at and said that he left her home at 12.45 a.m. and went to play video games with his 11-year-old son. However, years later, he changed his story and told Mary's daughter, Kira, that he left her house at 11.50 because he promised his son that he would be there by midnight, which he claimed he was. This doesn't add up because Mary wouldn't have even been home until around 12.15 a.m. since she stopped by her boss's house first. His son, now an adult, was asked to confirm his father's story, but he responded, and I quote, I'm not going to get into all that. He then made an interesting statement to the reporter. He said, I don't know if you remember old Nintendos or not, but I mean, almost all were one-player games. Unfortunately, the son died in 2020 without ever explaining what he meant. Many believe he was secretly trying to say that his father's alibi was bogus. Others who knew Randy were also questioned and recalled his behavior around the time of Mary's murder as suspicious. An old co-worker of his even said that Randy would say things like, I just want to kill that bitch. He also described him as a very crass and misogynistic individual. These comments also line up with comments he made to Mary's daughter. He told her, and I quote, she's just been driving me crazy. She's just, I mean, I'm not going to kill her or nothing, but I would like to punch her. He then laughed about it. Others have said that Randy often made crude remarks about women's underwear and was known to collect them. Interestingly, when Mary was found, she had no underwear on. To this day, he has never been arrested or charged with her murder. Another person of interest was a man named Deems Rowell, who had also been accused of stealing women's underwear. He and Mary knew each other because they allegedly ran in the same drug circle. A woman who dated Rowell said she found her dirty underwear on a hanger in his closet. She also said that he threatened to kill her. Investigators gave him a polygraph test and he failed. His DNA was collected, but it remains unknown if it's been tested or not. One theory is that Mary was dealing drugs out of Harold's club, but had also taken drugs for herself. When that was discovered, she was unable to pay them back and was murdered because of it. A known drug dealer in the area was Ryland Miller, and News 9 attempted to question him at his home, but he refused. However, he did take their call and pointed them in the direction of Mary's second husband's brother, Don Allen Jr. Interestingly, Don and Mary had done a drug run to Texas, but he claimed she didn't know they were actually transporting drugs. Just like Rowell, he denies involvement, but they do at least have his DNA. I'm going back now to her second husband, Tim Allen, and the father to her two daughters. Today, he is the most promising suspect in the case, well, besides Randy. When News 9 reached out to him, he refused to talk. Some believe he took revenge on Mary for stabbing him. He was also under financial pressure after being forced to pay thousands in child support money. One thing that puts him at the top of the list is that he called Mary's parents on the night of the murder and asked if the girls would be staying with them that night. Plus, he and his wife Lynn's alibis were each other. Remember, two weeks before she was murdered, they allegedly beat Mary up. Years later, they were asked to submit their DNA, but refused and lawyered up. 
At the time of the murder, investigators also looked into men who frequented the bar at Harold's Club. At the time, there were lots of out-of-towners who had come in to help repair the damage to the town after a horrible storm hit. However, all of them led to a dead end. By February of 1997, investigators had done all they could do and requested the help of the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation. Unfortunately, they said there are probably too many suspects in this case that match the killer and it would be hard to nail one down. After her murder, David went back to school and earned a degree in criminal justice with the hopes of solving his daughter's murder. Sadly, he and Mary's mother have since passed away, David in 2009 and Elizabeth in 2015. After the murder, her house became known as the scary home on the road. People have refused to enter her old bedroom and even the house itself. They've also said they felt like the windows on the house are staring at them. In 2021, a new special agent with the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation was assigned to Mary's case, but as of June 2024, her murder remains unsolved. Allie Renee Brown was born on March 30, 1996, in Kansas City, Missouri. In 2014, she graduated from Francis Howell Center. She was very athletic and participated in gymnastics, volleyball, and softball, and was also a cheerleader. Her brother described her as a happy and very outgoing individual who would do anything for anyone. In early 2017, 20-year-old Allie was living outside of Kansas City at the Trails at the Ridge Apartments with her two-year-old son, Carson. She had recently moved there wanting to make a fresh start. She was also letting her friend, 28-year-old Victoria Cherry Brown, who is of no relation to Allie, stay there as well. Victoria was born to parents Mark and Cheryl on June 9, 1988, in Rochester, New York. She went on to earn her master's degree in education and then taught math at Blue Springs High School. She also assisted with the school's marching band. Unfortunately, while living there, a horrible tragedy would occur, and in the end, three people would be dead. On January 12, 2017, at around 9.30 p.m., Allie and Victoria were in their apartment hanging out with Victoria's ex, 29-year-old Daryl Thomas. Also there was a 22-year-old female friend and Allie's two-year-old son, Carson. While hanging out, they received a knock on the door, and upon opening it, they were greeted by three men with guns. A couple of minutes later, the Kansas City Police received a 911 call about shots in Allie's apartment complex. Officers arrived at 9.40 p.m. and entered Allie's apartment to find that five people had been shot. Victoria and Daryl were sadly pronounced dead at the scene. When officers found Allie, she had also been shot but was alive and in critical condition. She was quickly rushed to the hospital, but sadly, doctors were unable to save her life. Carson was shot as well, a total of five times, and thankfully survived, along with the 22-year-old female friend. From witnesses, they learned that three men were let inside the apartment and began shooting everyone. It's believed the men were there for Daryl and not anyone else. While a motive has not been determined, Allie's family does not believe its drugs are gang-related. After the shooting, the suspects fled in a black or blue four-door vehicle. Unfortunately, as of June 2024, the suspects have not been located and this case remains unsolved. 